Thank you very much. We turn now to topical questions. And we start with question number one from Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in response to the figures for the first quarter of 2018-19 that show ScotRail's reliability is at its worst for over two decades. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. So, officer, I'm aware that ScotRail isn't performing as well as would be expected and demanded by the Scottish Government and customers. However, it is impossible to compare ScotRail's reliability today with that of 20 years ago, given the very significant increase over the past two decades in passenger numbers, additional seats provided and the introduction of new stations and routes. However, the Scottish Government continues to work closely with both partners of the ScotRail Alliance to ensure the 20 recommendations contained in their performance improvement plan are delivered. Alongside that, uh, Network Rail have increased resource levels to improve infrastructure reliability and resilience, with a specific focus in the Glasgow area to meet the needs of the busiest rail network out with London. It should be noted that Scott Rail's performance, as reported in the ORR quarter release at 88.9%, remains better than the GB average of 86.9%. We should not lose sight of the transformational process underway on our railways with record investment in infrastructure enhancements, as well as new and fully refurbished rolling stock, combining to deliver faster and additional services. Passion numbers continue to grow in response to this investment. Edward Mountain. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that long answer. I do agree with him that ScotRail have made many improvements with services, but delays and cancellations do mean that passengers cannot get to work, school, health appointments, or many of the other duties that they have to do during the day. Passengers, in my mind, are realistic about delays when they occur, often due to challenging weather conditions. However, Satisfaction in Scott, the way ScotRail handles these delays has decreased by 13% in the last year. Therefore, can the Cabinet Secretary specifically confirm what pressure the Government is putting on ScotRail to improve communications with passengers when delays occur, whether they're avoidable or not? Cabinet Secretary. Ebsang Officer, the member raises a, an important issue in recognising some of the challenges which we can have on the network. It may be of interest to remember that the uh, PPM uh, fares attributed to uh, network rail uh, increased by 51% alone uh, in the first quarter compared to the previous uh, quarter of the year uh, before, uh, which demonstrates that there are issues around uh, the way in which infrastructure challenges can then have a direct impact on rail service providers such as ScotRail, all the more reason for them to be working in partnership much more effectively to address these issues. And some of the investment that's going in specifically into the infrastructure in the Glasgow area through Network Rail, which has been coordinated through the Alliance, is to help to provide that greater resilience and reliability that's necessary. But equally, it is important to make sure that where there are delays and cancellations, uh, that that is communicated to the travelling public uh, effectively. Uh, and that there are support services there to assist individuals as and when it is necessary. Um, I've met with the head of the ScotRail Alliance and also with the new chief executive of Network Rail to impress on them very specifically the need to make sure that we have greater focus on reliability and how we communicate with the public when they're making use of their services with a clear understanding as to the implications it may have for them. So the member can be assured that these are issues that have been raised uh, both with uh, Scott Rail Alliance and also with Network Rail uh, specifically, and I expect them to continue to make progress as they take forward the improvement plan which they set out earlier this year. Edward Mount. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that reply. I would like particularly to get specific examples of how they are going to pr produce communications to those people that are delayed. And perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could allude to those by letter after this session. But turning to the latest performance figures, train services to Aviemore, for example, are 20% worse than the best performing stations across elsewhere in Scotland. Given that trains are so vital to the whole island economy, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if the Scottish Government are now consulting with ScotRail on what action it and plans it has specifically to improving performance to the Highlands? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, on the member's uh, final point there, he'll be aware that we've made a uh, significant investment in improving the, uh, the Northern of the Highland line um, in recent years, and that will uh, also be part of our plan going forward with the present SPTR, which has been taken forward, which will allow us to make further investments into infrastructure, in particular into our uh, rail infrastructure. But for example, the member will also be aware of the investments we've just put into uh, improving the line between Inverness and Aberdeen in order to improve and to increase uh, uh, speed of train journeys there. And the investment we're also making in the high speed train service, which will see the seven cities connections, which will help to improve reliability and also comfort. Uh, and the speed of services as well. So there's significant investment going in, uh, but uh, we've put in some £8 billion of investment into our rail network over the course of the last 10 years or so, and we will continue to have an, ambi an ambitious programme of investment uh, going forward. On the members, uh, first point in relation to uh, communication, I'm uh, more than happy to give the member more details on how ScotRail tend to improve in that uh, in going forward. And if the member does have uh, some very specific instances where uh, uh, constituents within his region uh, feel as though that has not been communicated properly to them, uh, then he should feel free to take that up specifically uh, with, uh, with ScotRail and if he is dissatisfied with the way in which they uh, have responded to those matters to bring these matters up with myself and I'm more than happy to get ScotRail to look at the matter in greater detail. Thank you. I've got five um, members wish to ask supplementaries. We'll see how many we get through, but succinct questions, succinct answers, please. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Last week, we learned that ScotRail's performance has plummeted over the last quarter with reliability at a record low and punctuality the worst since 2005. This week, ScotRail's own figures have shown that their performance has deteriorated so badly they have breached their franchise agreement. This is a failing franchise operating within a failed franchising model. But the Scottish Government have the power to end this franchise early, to bring it under public ownership by 2022. So will the Cabinet Secretary use the franchise break and bring Scotland's trains under public control so we have a railway system that puts passengers and not profits first? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I'm at uh, times quite confused by Labour's position on these matters. They very often say that we should get rid of franchises, which uh, we can't do because it's a reserved area. Uh, and also we sought to uh, make sure there was a level playing field between the public sector and the private sector in bidding for these matters, which was repeatedly refused by the previous Labour government. And we have now got agreement that that can actually be taken forward with the present UK uh, government. Uh, but I'm even confused to the point the fact that the Welsh Government have just awarded a contract to two private sector companies to deliver the railways in Wales. Uh, despite the rhetoric we get from Labour spokespersons on these issues and all of the hot air we've had from the Labour conference over the past couple of uh, days. So I'll tell you what we will do is we'll focus on making sure that we continue to make the very significant investment into our railways here in Scotland to make sure that we have got modern rolling stock, which is starting to be rolled out with the new uh, Class 385 trains that are coming into uh, play, which will provide greater uh, number of seats, faster services with the electrification programme that's at a very advanced stage, and we'll continue to make sure that we deliver on the improvements we want to see in our railways, and we'll leave the kid on politics to the Labour Party. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary please just clarify how many trains arrived on time in this period? What effect has recent bad weather had on punctuality? And can he confirm whether or not network rail's functions are devolved to Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, in relation to the member's final point, there's absolutely no doubt uh, that the responsibility of network rail here in Scotland should come under the responsibility of this government. Uh, and the reason that that is absolutely necessary, despite the fact that both parties are I think both Tory and Labour Party oppose us, is, but that's despite the fact that that would help us to align how we carry out our infrastructure investment into our railways and to do that align with the services that we require within the Scottish Rail Network. And I find it quite surprising that the Unionist parties in this Parliament continue to uh, oppose this type of approach. But we will continue to work with Net Rail, Network Rail to try and get the best service we can out of them uh, for the Scottish Network. But let me just give the, the members some examples. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, the PPM... Uh, Minister, uh, there's, there's two more to, questions. Uh, network Rail increased Minister, by 51%. Would the Minister keep his examples and give them as a response to the further three questions I'd like to call? And you could give the examples there. I'm trying to respond to the specific points members raised. Uh, you can give uh, the examples, question, you can give the examples the as a response to the further three questions. John Finney. Uh, I, and for a John Finney. Um, 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you'll be aware that one of the major factors contributing to the low performance is, the, uh, particularly in the Highlands, is the propensity of single track. Um, and you'll know that the, recently there's been a number of breakdowns, and a single breakdown there can bring the whole Highland Main Line to halt. Will you commit to significant investment beyond the modest investment that's already in place for Control Period 6 to address that significant deficiency, particularly when compared with the £3 billion expenditure on the road that runs beside it? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I discussed this matter with the member uh, just last week, uh, and he raised this uh, very matter. The member will be aware of the investment that's going into the Highland Line at the present uh, moment. What will happen is a part of the SPTR, as we move forward, it will allow us to look at what further investment should be made in the future. And that will look at how we can improve resilience on the existing line. The full details of that will be set out once we've actually completed the review work. But a key part of that will be about improving journey times and also resilience on that particular line. How that will be taken forward will be set out once we've actually completed the review work. Uh, Jamie Green. Thanks, Presiding Officer. The old adage says, fix the roof while the sun is shining. Uh, but the problem is, since March, uh, the PPM has got worse than over 60 stations in Scotland. Knowing that autumn, winter is a difficult period, traditionally, uh, for uh, results uh, on train punctuality and reliability, how confident is the Cabinet Secretary that we're not coming out of summer with bad results and come through winter with even worse ones? Cabinet Secretary. So, President Officer, one of the things which um, Network Rail are taking forward within the Scott Rail Alliance is to look at what additional infrastructure investment can be made in order to help to improve resilience. So, for example, uh, they're putting some £5 million of additional infrastructure investment into the Glasgow area in order to help to improve the infrastructure and the reliance that they can have um, upon that. That includes looking at what they can do around some additional measures, which is about uh, helping to make sure that particular points in the year, so for example, uh, cutting back in vegetation, uh, which may actually have an impact on the use of the lines at particular points during the course of the year, uh, particularly during the autumn, to minimise the risks and the difficulties which can come about as a result of that. And that's part of a wider package of around £34 million which they're spending to try to help to improve and enhance resilience in these areas. Uh, one of the very specific issues which I discussed with, um, uh, with the Scott Rail Alliance was the additional measures they're putting in place this autumn and this winter compared to last year. So one of the things that they're doing is uh, not only carrying out some of this additional work, but they've also brought in some additional machinery uh, to help to provide greater resilience within the network as well, so that they can deal with issues as and when they arise. So there's no doubt there will continue to be challenges uh, during the course of the autumn and the winter within our rail network. Uh, but what they have assured me of is that they have learned some of the lessons from last year and from previous years, made additional investments to try to help to address some of these issues uh, to help to support them through this autumn and this winter. And I hope that will produce better results going forward. But time will tell um, over the course of this winter. Uh, but they've made it very clear to me that they're determined to do everything they can to try to help to reduce some of the challenges which they have faced in the past. And apologies to Stuart McMillan. No time for another question on that. And question number two, Bruce Crawford. In, in relation you, to the questions just gone, I, I, understandably, you're looking for brevity and answer from the ministers. But it did strike me how it was possible for a minister or indeed yourself to anticipate a question that was coming later so that, so that so, uh, so the minister was not able to fully give the answer. How, how, how are you, or, or indeed the, the minister, able to anticipate what questions coming after to be able to follow up in that way? Well, Mr Crawford has been in the chamber long enough to know the answer to that, and that is brief questions from the members. I think Mr Lyle, in that case, asked three three questions of the Minister. The Minister answered the first one on Network Rail, wasn't able to get through all the PPMs, but the Minister's got plenty of opportunity to give that information and answered four other questions, which I think is a lot on this particular issue. And we are running out of time now. So moving on to question number two, Anas Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what arrangements it is making for ordering the enhanced flu vaccination for the forthcoming immunisation programme. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Scotland, as with the rest of the UK, we are advised on vaccination policy by the Independent Expert Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, JCVI. JCVI recommended, recommends which vaccine programme programmes should be offered, eligibility criteria and the kind of vaccine that should be used in the programme. In November 2017, following a review of the um, seasonal flu vaccine, uh, JCV advised the use of adjuvanted um, trivalent flu vaccine ATIV in those aged over 65. They agreed that the use of this vaccine should be a priority for those aged over 75. 
who will derive the greatest benefit. The clinical evidence is clear that the vaccine offered to 65 to 74 year olds this winter still provides protection against flu to that group. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, given you. Thanks, although it is worth noting that the Minister did ask for extra time to Can be I, able to answer in am detail. Am I okay to, to continue? You, you may, Mr. Okay, th this is important because it's important. Our, 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 our flu vaccination programme get, gets underway next week and it's really important that people understand that the vaccines that are being offered offer them the best possible protection. I would encourage anybody who sh is, is requiring vaccination is in one of the groups to go and get that. Um, the NSS... Uh, undertakes the seasonal flu vaccine procurement on behalf of NHS Scotland um, each year uh, to ensure they can acquire the volume of flu vaccines required for each season. They begin procurement early autumn for the next flu season. That meant that the procurement exercise for this year's flu season had already concluded when JCVI made its recommendations. NSS nonetheless continued to fully explore options to secure the vaccine availability for everyone aged over, 70, over 65. The new ATIV vaccine is currently manufactured by only one supplier who had a significantly had to ramp up their production for the whole of the UK very quickly. And unfortunately, they were unable to guarantee NHS Scotland sufficient supply of the ATIV vaccine for everyone over 65 this year in time for the start of this year's vaccination programme. So we did what was obviously provided the most security to ensure we had the vaccina a vaccination programme program for the whole of Scotland. And that's our Officer, the Minister will be aware that across England and Wales, all individuals aged over 65 and over are to be offered and are recommended to accept the enhanced flu vaccination as standard, potentially leading to tens of thousands of fewer GP appointments and hospital stays and hundreds of fewer deaths. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain why this life-saving flu vaccination is only available to all over 75s in Scotland, um, and, uh, sorry, all over 75s, when in the rest of the UK it's to all over 65s? Minister. So, um, procurement arrangements differ across the UK um, for the seasonal flu vaccination programme. Whilst we procure the seasonal flu vaccine centrally in England and Wales, it's up to individual GPs to decide what vaccines should be ordered for their patients. In the past, this has led to vaccine shortages and concerns over variations in access to the right flu vaccine. And these are problems that we don't face here in Scotland. While Mr Sarwa is correct, it, to some extent that other parts of the UK have recommended that GPs provide this vaccine. It's clearly up to the GPs which, order, which um, vaccines they order and it is not clear that given the um, vaccine supply whether GPs across the rest of the UK will be able to buy enough vaccine to do so. So after seeking um, expert advice it was clear that the safer approach for us to take um, would be to roll out the new vaccine during 2018 and 2019 that guarantees a supply of the flu vaccine for everyone el eligible. Minister, the, the fact is, in the rest of the UK, the over 65s are being offered and recommended to accept the enhanced flu vaccination, and in Scotland, it's all the over 75s. It, that is factually the case. It, now, the reason why this is so concerning is that last year in Scotland, the number of flu deaths rose from 71 in 16-17 to over 330 in 17-18. As a result, the First Minister rightly ordered an urgent investigation into the matter to learn lessons for this year. Can the Minister tell us whether that investigation took place, when it reported and what the recommendations are? Because it would be completely unacceptable for us to try and learn lessons from a review that hasn't published yet for this year's immunisation programme before the immunisation programme even begins. Minister. So, first of all, just to, to, to clarify that we take our advice from the experts in terms of the best way to approach this. If I can go back to what I gave, the answer I gave Mr Sarwar to the, his previous question, while in other parts of the UK there is a recommendation that GPs provide that vaccine, it is not centrally uh, procured, so it is not clear, it is not clear that across the UK and other parts of the UK that vaccine will be available to all over 75-year-olds, never mind over 65-year-olds. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister outline how the childhood flu vaccination programme in Scotland compares with those in other parts of the UK? Would members stop please interrupting and talking across another member? Minister. So, ma ma Ms Harper um, makes actually, uh, this question is, is actually very important because while we're talking about the, the, the flu vaccine for over 65s, um, we also have um, 
um, additional programme where we're offering the quadrivalent flu vaccine to healthcare workers, to pregnant women and to other vulnerable groups. That particular vaccine contains an additional flu B strain, which is more, um, more likely to affect the working age population. Um, so that new vaccine will provide those groups with further protection against the flu. And unlike in England, we've extended this to cover all school children, um, so which in addition to providing uh, school children with that, per that uh, protection from the flu for themselves also offers herd immunity so as well as hel helping themselves they'll be offering protection to their grandparents and that's something we are is it's really important we're a, a big step ahead of the rest of the UK. Thank you thank you to ministers and members and we're going to move on now to the next item of business which is a statement by Claire Hockey on the mental health strategy 2018 annual report. The Minister will, of course, as usual, take questions at the end of her statement. I would urge all members who wish to ask the Minister a question to press their request to speak, request to speak buttons as soon as possible.